good afternoon. Um, I am Mawash Kasi, and I, uh, along with Dr. Suman Chang and Dr. Sharif Naga, would be talking about multimodality uh, imaging in patients with left ventricular assist devices. Um, before I start, um, I want to say that in uh, patients who have left ventricular assist device, not one modality uh, is enough. In our institution, we employ both echocardiography and uh, CT to basically not only follow these patients clinically, but also troubleshoot um, uh, device-related alarms and complications. In the first 30 minutes of this presentation, I will talk about echocardiography um, and basically a heart failure specialist view about echocardiography and what I want when a patient undergoes an echocardiogram. So in terms of what I need when I have uh, or order an echocardiogram is basically assessment of LV unloading, assessment of regression lesions, uh, looking for thrombi, RV dysfunction and RV failure, which is basically the bane of our existence in patients uh, when, assess when uh, following patients with LVAD. And then, um, of course, troubleshooting alarms, including low flow and suction. So the current device technology, we have HeartMate 2, which is becoming more and more obsolete, And um, but we do have a good spectrum of patients that are still on support with HeartMate 2. We have the HVAD and then the HeartMate 3. The HVAD has a distinct advantage because it does allow you to follow the waveforms um, and it has a touch screen that you can attach the patient to and look at the waveforms and uh, kind of troubleshoot the complications from that. Um, the HeartMate 3 is the newest uh, device on the block, and it has far less uh, complications related to pump thrombosis and has a better hypocompatibility profile, meaning less thrombosis, less GI bleeding compared to the older devices. In general, um, when just talking about device types, HeartMate 2 was an axial flow device, and HVAD and HeartMate 3 are basically centrifugal device. Um, they all are uh, require anticoagulation with aspirin and coumadin. Uh, the usual uh, pump speed for HeartMate 2 was anywhere between 8800 to 9200, and for HVAD, it, in clinically, what the speed we adjust is between 2600 to even up to um, uh, 3400 or so, depending on the patient's size. And then HeartMate 3, the device, um, usually clinically, the speed that we're using are between 4,800 to up to um, uh, 5,500 or so. Now, um, each pump has um, a different um, iteration of how it reacts to blood pressure or the differential of pressure between the left ventricle and the aorta. So basically, as you can imagine, uh, the LVAD has an inflow cannula that is in the left ventricle and then an outflow cannula that is in the aorta. The H in this um, is the differential pressure between the left ventricle and the aorta pressure. And the flow is basically dependent on not only your uh, revolutions per minute, but also the differential uh, that exists between the left ventricle and the aorta. Therefore, uh, patients who are on LVAD support are sensitive to changes in blood pressure. They're sensitive to changes in preload, meaning volume. They're sensitive to changes related to LV contractility. Uh, some pumps are more sensitive. Uh, we think that the HVAD is more sensitive to afterload than um, HeartMate 3, and uh, whereas other pumps are not as sensitive to these changes. In the big picture, whether these changes are important, in, in a sense they are, because as we can imagine that patients, and, uh, when they're on LVAD support, they're doing different activities in a day, they're moving around, they're exercising. So um, this uh, pressure differential or, or, or uh, the pressure sensitivity basically helps uh, uh, regulate flow in these patients with changes in blood pressure. Um, the HQ curves are different for each device type. This is an example of an HVAD HQ curve, and you can see if the pressure differential was somewhere around 150 at the same RPM, at 3,000 RPMs, um, the flow can be four liters, but if the pressure changes to 100, uh, the flow would then be different at the same RPM, meaning a higher flow, which is six liters per minute. Now, going um, uh, forward to uh, what do we expect in echocardiogram? So this is a personal long axis. Um, when I see this image at the first onset, I look at uh, basically the LV and diastolic dimension. You can see the LV inflow, uh, the inflow cannula in the left ventricle here. The position of the inflow cannula is important, whether it's abutting the septum or the lateral wall. 
In addition to that, whether the aortic valve is opening or not. Now here, you can nicely see that the aortic valve does not open. Um, and, um, and then the other important things are to look for in this particular view with color doctor uh, regurgitation lesions, including AR and mitral regurgitation, because those can be signs of unloading. And in addition to that, looking at this right ventricle, what is the function of this right ventricle? In just the peristernal long view, we can see a lot of this information. Now, um, like I mentioned, if uh, the aortic valve opening is important to us, uh, particularly if we're um, trying to figure out whether they're appropriately unloaded in an unloaded situation, the aortic valve would no longer open. If there is a question about whether the AV is opening or not, you can do a, a um, M mode across the aortic valve and look at the AV opening. Now, moving on to a four chamber view. In this view, what I really want to know is again the relationship between the right ventricle and the left ventricle. For us as heart failure cardiologists, the RV LV interdependence is extremely important. So, the septal location is extremely important. In this view, you cannot see the inflow cannula very well. But there is a subtle sign that the inflow cannula is perhaps over here and maybe a little bit pointing towards the septum, but not abutting. Um, the um, size of the LA and RA are important, and the relative um, uh, interatrial septum location is also important to kind of guesstimate the, um, whether the patient has RV failure or not. You would see if there's a high RA pressure, there might be um, that the interatrial septum might be abutted toward uh, maybe uh, pointing towards the left atrium. Similarly, if the right ventricle is humongous and there is RV failure, you would see the interventricular septum deviating towards the left side. Um, then moving on, uh, the position of the inflow cannula is extremely important. As I mentioned, this is a patient where there has been some degree of um, LV recovery. The ejection fraction is not always less than 20% in this patient. So when we do order echoes, we would like to know the ejection fraction in these patients. And then if you look at the inflow cannula position here, this is a nice example of how the inflow cannula is abutting the septum. In this patient, uh, more so because the um, LV had a contractile reserve. And as a result of that, in each system, you could see that the inflow cannula was abutting the septum. Clinically, what we were seeing in this patient is that she was having a lot of low flow alarms. Now, um, in uh, my mind, while it is important to look at the inflow cannula dopplers, I do not find them clinically useful because um, the issue with the angulation, a lot of times or most of the times, the inflow cannula is not appropriately aligned and you have to really get into off-axis positions. Whether this should be clinically used or not is still um, uh, not uh, very clear. Um, and there is no clear data. There have been some studies showing the systolic and diastolic velocity ratios of the inflow cannula. But um, in my perspective, vastly, uh, it is so off axis that I do not think we can make a good um, clinical judgment based on the inflow cannula doctor. This is an outflow cannula, um, and here our sonographer has nicely captured the Doppler flow in the outflow cannula. We try to go up in the right upper sternal border and capture the best position for the outflow cannula. This is a Doppler, which is also, again, a nice depiction of the Doppler signals in a patient who has a heart rate three. The intermittent signal, um, you can see that the diastolic velocity completely drops to zero, and these are the systolic uh, waveforms. The other thing I really want to see when you're doing 2D images is basically the inferior vena cava. Um, in um, clinical practice, what we've learned is that the JVP in patients with LVAD may be um, elevated and may not necessarily mean that they are volume overloaded. But for me, the, the in IVC, uh, how big is it and what does it do with the sniff is very important to make a clinical judgment. And a lot of times I do change my clinical, um, uh, do change my um, decision to give them diuretics or not or go going up or down on the speed based on what I'm seeing in the IBC. Now, again, as I mentioned, um, it's very important to know the LV function. The uh, prior um, video that I showed was of a patient where um, the LV was more robust and was contracting okay. So again, an assessment of um, LV function is important. This is um, uh, somebody who has a newer implant and their LV size is dilated, LVF is very, very reduced. Now, um, there is um, a question about, you know, often we don't get uh, very good images for patients who have LVAD. Uh, for one, I, I, I do think it, um, it requires a little bit more persistence on the part of the echocardiographer. 
or sonographer to capture better images. But there have been some newer studies where uh, utilizing different um, uh, views for capturing uh, uh, better image quality in patients who have LVAD. And one of those views is basically the transhepatic um, uh, view where they were able to capture um, the RV and LV better and was more feasible and they were able to actually um, angulate better with the inflow cannula. So uh, there is room for improving and utilizing different views in these LVADs. Now, there are some image-specific nuances. Sometimes people uh, worry about this kind of um, turbulent flow pattern that they see. This is a um, basically what I call an art, a waterfall artifact that you can see because of the actual LVAD hum, not necessarily because there's anything wrong with it. Several times I get questioned about this retrograde flow. This is actually the Navare cycle, which is kind of like a washout jet that is new to some of the newer devices. Um, and this essentially is where the RPMs of the the LVAD fall and then they increase again. And this is essentially for uh, washing out the inflow cannula so that it doesn't have a uh, uh, fibrin deposit or thrombi formation. So there are some imaging specific nuances and it's important to keep up with uh, the different device types and their functionality when reading uh, patients, uh, um, LVAD patient echocardiograms. Now, what is um, LV unloading? The question that I had asked in the first slide. Uh, basically, um, uh, what we really do in the cat lab and the echo, cardio and the echo uh, lab is that we do concomitant hemodynamic and echocardiographic parameters. And we do what is called a RAM study where we gradually increase uh, the speed of the LVAD to see if one, the patient can tolerate it, two, if it can normalize the hemodynamics in the patient. Effective unloading is where um, the LV hemodynamics are optimized, meaning that your veg is normal, your um, uh, cardiac output is optimal without causing an imbalance in the septal interaction that I talked about earlier, which is um, uh, the interaction between the RV and LV and the relative um, uh, direction of the septum. Uh, so the question I always get asked is, do RAM studies make a difference? Yes, they do benefit our patients. Um, in clinically stable patients where, for instance, I saw somebody in clinic and I assume that they are clinically stable and they look okay from a volume perspective, um, there was a study that was done which showed that um, a lot of times our clinical judgment is actually inaccurate and ECHO did change our, um, our perspective of if the patient was um, adequately unloaded or not. And in a lot of patients, they found that, um, you know, we, we were wrong about their clinical status. We were wrong about their hemodynamics. And in 79% of the patient, we ended up increasing the patient's uh, LVAD speed. And did, that did um, translate into a positive impact in the patient's unloading. And it had a sustainable positive impact in the follow-up up to three to six months. This was the ramp it up study. And you can see in the cohort where we used echo and cath to um, uh, really uh, uh, unload them appropriately and optimize their hemodynamics. These patients did better um, in terms of events compared to control. Now, typical echo features that are uh, related to inadequate unloading are dilated LA and uh, LB, um, uh, more than a moderate mitral regurgitation, uh, systolic PA pressure greater than 40, and the E to A, a, a peak um, adopter velocity greater than two. Um, the optimal unloading is um, thought to be one at which you have aortic valve is opening either intermittently or is closed. The interventricular septum is midline. Um, the mitral and aortic regurgitation are minimized. The wedge pressure is less than um, 18 and the central venous pressure is less than 12. Now, um, we can actually use ECHO to um, tell us about the hemodynamics in patients. This was a study done from, uh, actually two studies done from our center um, uh, led by Dr. Naga and Dr. Estep, where we looked at the uh, Doppler parameters to assess if the patients had adequately unloaded or not. For instance, if you had an E2P uh, ratio greater than two with an RA pressure greater than 10 or a left atrial um, volume index greater than 33 with E to E prime uh, ratio greater than 14, and uh, this was correlated with batch greater than 15, and that needed augmentation of medical therapy or increasing the pump spin, uh, speed 
Um, so this is uh, where uh, somebody with normal pulmonary capillary breast pressure and LVAT support with the actual uh, pulmonary capillary breast pressure of approximately nine. As you can see, the E and A ratio, the E to E prime were less than 15. And this is somebody who had elevated uh, pulmonary capillary breast pressure greater than 15, where you can see that the E to A, A ratio is high um, and the E to E prime is 15 uh, with the PS systolic pressure that is high. Um, and the, there is a, a clinical correlation of hemodynamic ramp assessment um, in, in uh, clinical outcomes, as I mentioned earlier, and patients who do have better hemodynamics actually do better in the long term. Now, is there a role for 3D echocardiography? 3D echocardiography brings into perspective things that we actually don't think about, uh, basically uh, the spherical index or the conical index of the LV and the RV, which are uh, kind of the newer parameters. And there have been studies which show that the sphericity and the chronicity index are actually correlated with outcomes. Um, in, um, and it is interesting to see that how um, different uh, device types actually behave differently with, uh, um, with uh, in terms of uh, the, L the changes in the LB size and the RB size on 3D echo, as well as the change in the sphericity and the chronicity. For instance, in HeartMate 2, as we can see, as the LVAT speed was increasing, you do see a decrease in the LV volume and the RV volume increases. Um, and uh, the conicity actually increases, whereas the sphericity decreases. The HVATs behave differently uh, as LV conicity and sphericity do not significantly change with increasing in the pump speed. Um, and the RV showed an overall uh, trend towards larger volume with increasing the LVAT speed. And the overall um, magnitude was much lower compared to that in heart rate too. As you can see here, the sphericity and conicity actually are staying almost um, the same and the change in RV and LV volume are much different as, and, uh, compared to what was seen in yeah, heart rate too. Similarly, heart rate three, um, with increasing LVAT speed, the shape becomes less spherical and more conical in these patients. The RV volumes remain stable uh, for the most part, except at very high speed and on an average, the RV septum becomes less convex at the highest LVAT speed. So what this really means is that maybe in heart rate 3, the profile of the right ventricle is more favorable as compared to HVATs in heart rate 2. Now, if you do have a patient who have um, ineffective unloading, the differential diagnosis could be because they might be set at a lower speed or they have hypertension. Remember the HQ curves that I talked about where there's excessive afterload that really uh, affects the differential pressure, hence affecting the unloading. There could be outflow kinking, uh, the inflow cannula malposition. These are things that we can better assess with CT scan, which Dr. Chang is going to talk about, whether there is pump malfunction, and um, if there is continuous aortic regurgitation. Now, aortic regurgitation is a problem um, as uh, in, if, if there is a significant lesion, it results in formation of a closed loop. And so there is ineffective forward flow. Um, up to 50% to patient of the patients can develop moderate to severe aortic regurgitation at 18 months, and it is associated with poor outcomes. Um, however, how do we quantify aortic regurgitation? Here in guidelines, we have the vena contractor and the jet width greater than 46%, and a vena contractor greater than three millimeters considered significant. Uh, this is a patient who has a lot of aortic regurgitation and had multiple hospital admission, and it was essentially an HIA class four despite aggressive medical therapy. Um, there is definitely then role for um, considering um, DAVR or surgical aortic valve closure or replacement in patients who have an LVAT. But we have to be very wary of how we quantify the aortic regurgitation as um, these uh, procedures are associated with a lot of complications and um, they're not as easy as patients without LVAT. As I mentioned, um, even in the newer uh, population and the data, significant aortic regurgitation is associated with significant hemocompatibility related outcomes, including worsening, GI bleeding, more strokes, um, even more pump thrombosis. Now, there is a newer parameter that was um, uh, brought into um, a light by Dr. Uriel and his group. And in this, they looked at, um, uh, since there is no effective way to uh, actually quantify the um, aortic regurgitation volume, they came up with this cool technique where they looked at the right heart cath as well as the flow um, from the echo and uh, calculated the regurgitant volume. And based on this, they did hemodynamic data concomitantly and 
compared the traditional parameters, including Nina contracta, with the newer parameters, which is the SD uh, ratio, the systolic and diastolic ratio of the outflow cannula, as well as the diastolic acceleration time. In their study, they correlated this uh, with wedge pressure and found that if you had a systolic to diastolic ratio that was becoming lower, that was associated with severe aortic regurgitation and a diastolic acceleration, if it was um, increasing, that was associated with moderate to severe aortic regurgitation. Um, this is somebody who has um, no or mild, this is um, moderate, and this is moderate to severe aortic regurgitation, um, where you can see the gap between the systolic and the diastolic velocity starts to decrease and the slope starts to increase. Um, and this was again correlated with uh, uh, for outcomes more so than the traditional method. So is it time to abandon the traditional parameters? Um, and that is a question that is uh, 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 bothering a lot of us um, heart failure cardiologists. However, to answer this question, um, in our own lab, we created a mock circulatory flow loop, which is echo compatible. And what we're trying to assess is um, accurate uh, aortic regurgitation volume and then quantifying our um, echo uh, parameters. And uh, this is uh, the Doppler flow from the from our uh, uh, model. And this is the, uh, the continuous wave Doppler. And in our study, uh, at least in the preliminary study, what we saw is that the traditional echo parameters actually over exaggerate uh, the severity of aortic regurgitation. Um, more to come, but uh, I would say that exert caution in assessing uh, the volume of aortic regurgitation using just the traditional parameters. In addition to that, we have pump thrombosis as a complication. The good news is that the rate of pump thrombosis has been decreasing, yet with HVAD still, we do have pump thrombosis, and it's important to make this diagnosis. Usual workup includes hemolysis panel um, in addition to echo, and you can use CAP. What um, uh, was done in the last uh, 10 years is that a novel technique or the RAMP study was used to then assess um, if the um, LVAD is unloading effectively or not. In, in essence, if your LVAD doesn't unload effectively, that tells you that the device is malfunctioning. Um, and um, of course, you basically look at um, not only the pump parameters, but also then look at these uh, features, which is LV and diastolic dimension, the AV opening, AI, MR, and then the RV systolic pressure. Now, the incidence, as I mentioned, of pump thrombosis um, has in general uh, decreased, but it's still there for some device types, including HVAD. And um, if you look at if this is a device, um, this is for HeartMate 2, so it doesn't necessarily um, uh, extrapolate to HVAD or HeartMate 3. But in a patient who has a device malfunction, the LV and diastolic dimension doesn't decrease um, very well with increasing LVAD speed. Um, the aortic uh, valve opening time in milliseconds also uh, doesn't decrease a lot as opposed to somebody who has no malfunction where the aortic valve actually doesn't close um, uh, or closes and doesn't open anymore. And uh, the right-sided cardiac output, if you look at that, that uh, doesn't increase uh, with uh, increasing the LVAD speed. And if you look at the deceleration time, um, it uh, basically increases where in uh, no mal pump malfunction, it increases quite a bit, uh, increasing from 162 to 251 uh, milliseconds at the highest speed. Um, so one, however, pitfall of RAM studies for pump thrombosis is that the loading conditions matter. And this was um, deciphered in this study by Aditya et al, where they looked at the effect of aortic regurgitation and after load on the RAM studies. And what they found was that if you had severe aortic regurgitation or if your blood pressure was high, you could actually have false positives for pump thrombosis. So it's very important to clinically correlate um, what you're finding with echocardiography and pump thrombosis is more of a clinical diagnosis, but echocardiography is an important tool. Uh, this is an example of um, uh, somebody with pump malfunction as the pump increased from 8,000 to 11,000. You can see that the aortic valve continues to open as can be seen in this M mode. Um, and this is somebody who has normal pump function um, where uh, at, compared to the lowest and the highest speed, you can see the deceleration time um, increase from 194 to 423. Um, and the AOV valve actually closes with higher speed. Uh, this is an example of, again, uh, malfunction where, one, the LV size um, doesn't decrease. Uh, the AV opening time uh, kind of the aortic valve still continues to open, even though there might be some reduction in time. And the deceleration time, as you can see, can, uh, the, the overall change is only 8 milliseconds. Uh, 
Now, the other important thing about echocardiography is the assessment of right ventricle. As I mentioned earlier, it is the bane of our existence. This is a catastrophic RV uh, failure where you can see that um, uh, this is right post-operative in somebody who had a heart rate 3 L bad and the LV is completely sucked in and the right ventricle has is humongous with the right atrium that's humongous and it's completely abutting onto the left ventricle and the left atrium. And this is very profound right ventricular failure. Of course, this is again a clinical diagnosis. At the bedside, we saw that the patient's CVP jumped up to 25 with a cardiac index that dropped to 0.9 despite being on 4,800 RPMs on the heart rate 3 L. So this is um, one of a kind uh, capture on echo. As you can see, the RV is humongous and there is profound RV failure. Now, um, certain maneuvers can also help um, in understanding uh, what is happening to the inflow cannula. Um, particularly, again, the septal interaction is important. And while you're doing echocardiogram, you can make the patient do Valsalva maneuver, or um, if they're having suction events, you can reproduce the same position that they were having suction events in and see um, if with that change in position, you were able to demonstrate the suction um, and capture it on echo concomitantly. Um, the other thing that uh, ECHO, of course, is useful for is um, uh, troubleshooting alarms. So, for instance, this is a patient who had low flow alarms. This is post-operative, um, a few days in when the patient finally had a therapeutic INR. And uh, the question here was really the right ventricle was also enlarged, but we also saw a pericardial fusion. So the question was whether this is RV failure or um, basically elevated um, uh, CVP as a result of profound pericardial effusion. One thing to remember that in LVAD patient, even a small effusion can make a big change. Um, and this patient was taken to the OR and with the resolution of this pericardial effusion, the low flow alarms completely um, improved. Um, again, as I mentioned, a small effusion in LVAD goes a large way. So even this one is of course a little bit bigger, uh, but um, uh, we've seen clinically that a lot of patients even if they're moderate effusion, when we take them to the OR and relieve the effusion, they actually do better. So this uh, brings to end uh, my section on echocardiography, and I'm going to let Dr. Chang talk about uh, the CT utilization in our, our uh, patients with LVAD. Yes, good afternoon. Thank you, Mawash. Can you all hear me? Yes. Good. Let me try to see. I have to share my screen. Okay. Okay. I think Mawash might have. Do you have to get out first? Because telling me that I cannot share and with other person share. Okay, good. Okay, can you all see my screen? Hello? Yes, Dr. Chang, we can see you. Thank you. Thank you, my watch. That was an excellent presentation. Um, so why do we use cardiac CT? Uh, as you can see, cardiac CT allows us to do uh, imaging of the entire uh, cardiovascular structure connected to the LVAD. And that's what we really need to do, pay attention not only to the LVAD device and its component, but also uh, all the entire cardiovascular uh, uh, structure because a lot of complication and normality be, uh, could be found in, the, in, in that area. So we use CT because it allows to do 2D uh, visualization, allows to do 3D visualization, and also 4D visualization, which um, you can see here. You can see the movement and the 3D, and, and it sometimes could be, uh, could be useful for surgeon for uh, uh, procedural planning. So uh, just, I want to go through quickly the different component of the LVAD and the potential complication that CT will be helpful in detecting and help manage the patient. So this is uh, kind of like um, a 3D rendering and um, 
MIB rendering and an X-ray of a pay, uh, the three type of LVAD that Mawash mentioned as a Harmony 2, you, you got Harmony 3, and you got hardware. You can see they are very different. Um, the, the, they are obviously made of metallic component and that could generate a lot of artifacts, especially for hardware. It's about uh, could generate a lot of uh, beam hardening, blooming artifact who could actually become a challenge to evaluate. Uh, as a matter of fact, Harmony 2 uh, is probably the easiest one to evaluate different component, but uh, so this is a new challenge that we have with the newer generation uh, device. First, we look, let's look, look at the inflow camera position. Ideally, the inflow camera position, the tip should be directing as parallel as possible to the axis of the mitral inflow. In this case, it's a well position in Harmony 2. So when he's not well positioned, like in this patient who had Harmony 2, and had recurrent slow V tag and you know an, an alarm. Uh, you can see there's a lot, of, a lot of turbulent flow, high velocity flow up to four meter in the, in the inflow cannula, and you can see the inflow cannula tips completely embedded into the uh, interventricular septum. But not all of them has this degree of uh, uh, severe. Um, Malposition. This is another case of a patient who had a history of uh, GI bleed, and he was actually following UTMB and echo over there, uh, kind of show uh, very turbulent flow and high velocity up to almost four meter in the inflow cannula. This was patient was transferred here, echo was repeated here, documenting uh, high velocity possible obstruction and they were concerned about clot formation. Uh, whatever reason, I couldn't find, realize why the patient had a TE, but eventually patient, the next test was had a TE and pretty much probably doesn't add too much. You can see the turbulent flow and because of the angulation, as my wash mentioned, you know, the inflow Doppler, camera Doppler velocity could be affected by the angulation. Like in this case, same patient, the velocity was four meter was transthoracic and barely elevated or even normalish looking T. So um, CT was performed. As you can see here, there's not a frank abutment into this, into this uh, anterior wall, but you can see this corde being sucked into the tip of the cannula. Okay, so this is important. You need to go on different projection and see actually uh, the degree of the obstruction and suction. Of the, so with this degree, it could generate up to four meters. So this is a learning process for us too, because when I first see cases like this, I say, well, this is not too bad, but if you have the, you can see the Doppler that I showed before, this could generate a lot of gradient. Okay, this is another case um, again. Now I'm very dramatic, but in the short axis, you can see this probably doesn't obstruct more than 50% of the test with a velocity of around two meter. And this patient have very high LDH. So we don't quite understand what's the clinical significance of this finding. And you know, the only way to, to, to find out is to follow this patient longitudinally and, and see what happened. And this is, so not only the Harmony 2, uh, because of the design, remember Harmony 2, the palm is put into in a, a peritoneal space. And with the newer device, the hardware or Harmony 3, the palm is, and the inflow cannula is made of one unit and is inserted directly into the LV cavity. So we don't see as often the malposition that I showed you earlier, all those cases are Harmony 2. But we do, we do occasionally still can see some cases like this one of um, not a perfect, you can see the tip of the, cam the cannula is pointing toward the myocardium. And again, this is what I want to mention, so hardware does not, does not only cause a lot of artifact and CT, could also cause a lot of artifact and echo, and such in this case, 
uh, even with a reasonable uh, alignment, we really cannot say anything about the, cannot have, with the Doppler signal is really suboptimal. So those are the challenges that we So outflow cannula, and this is a normal looking outflow cannula, as you can see. And it could have all different kind of uh, finding that we try to interpret it, for instance. For instance, this anastomosis side between alpha cannula and sending iota, uh, we learned that with the hardware, usually it's a smaller diameter compared to hardware, Harme 3. However, lately I've seen this, uh, I think the surgeon or company has corrected. So this actually has become larger. So I, we, don't, we, we don't know what the clinical significance. I think Mawash has special interest in looking at this relationship. So uh, we have quite a few cases. So it will be very interesting to go back and look at what the anastomosis size, because this is about less than one centimeter and, uh, and the cross section about one centimeter square. Uh, I don't know what, we really don't know the significance of this finding in affecting the performance of the hemodynamic performance of the LVAD. So this is some of the examples of complication you can see in the alpha cannula. So this then uh, really disconnect between the graph and the cannula. And this has been corrected by the company uh, been recalled a couple of years ago. And this is one of the most severe cases we've seen a kinking of the cannula. Um, remember the LVAD is placed with the chest open. So once you close the chest, uh, sometime there could be not enough room and you can cause it all. The, uh, uh, fortunately, this is a very unusual and out of several hundred cases we've seen, this is probably the only case of severe kinking that we think could cause some type of hemodynamics uh, compromise. Obviously you could have clotting of the outflow cannula as in this case, or in the patient with pseudoaneurysm uh, and this actually a patient presented with recurring bleeding through the dry line. I would, the, the theory is there's a pseudoaneurysm and a slow leak um, of the blood tracking the, the device and the patient end up having uh, intravascular, uh, use, um, uh, intravascular uh, treatment with vascular occluder. So thrombus, um, we really don't see this as often anymore with the newer device. Uh, I have not recall any cases of this traumatic thrombosis of inflow alpha cannula with the hardware or HARMA3, uh, like in this case that's documented with uh, explant. However, this couple of cases we've seen recently, we're learning more and more, and you can see this kind of like a strain, uh, hypoattenuation material floating inside the outflow, the outflow cannula. Uh, it's not common, but we do see occasionally. And you know, this is a, just happened to a case of a patient who had a history of stroke. But we do have cases the patient is completely asymptomatic. Again, uh, it's one of those cases, the imaging, the power imaging that allow you to see something, but we, it's up to us to, to find the clinical correlation of this abnormal finding. The other, the other frequent, frequent finding that I, we see is this area of hypoattenuation along the cannula. First, when I first reading the CT, you know, almost 10 years ago in the LVAP patient, and we thought this could be clot, but, and there's been some study uh, showing that this is actually ex, uh, uh, extravasation uh, of the plasma fluid outside the cannula because the lining of the, um, uh, the grab is porous. So this is accumulation is almost like seroma accumulation. So, and, and with more experience, we know this is not quite static. Most of the patient is quite stable, but this is a case of patient actually in, in, in two years, uh, this area has increased. And this, this last year, there was a report in Jack Imaging showing that this case could lead to almost a tamponade physiology twisting of the uh, of the graph inside the cannula and cause uh, a severe malfunction. So again, uh, longitudinal study of this patient will be very helpful to see 
was a black natural history of the hypoattenuation. For patients, the other major use of CT is to look at the source of emboli or stroke, like in this patient who has uh, stroke and uh, kind of subtherapeutic INR, trying to have clot in two coronary sinus. Sorry about that. And you can see that uh, it could happen almost anywhere. I mean, traditionally, if you look at the literature, people mention that this clot, usually aortic root clot, occurs most commonly in the non-coronary cusp because there's no coronary, there's more stasis. But our experience is at least we have about 10 cases of this. Uh, you know, uh, obviously, it could happen anywhere, as I show you here. I just want to give you the most, just the most recent case that we have. Is a young person who just had a LVAP put in two years ago, harming three, come with severe chest pain and troponin 93. So this is ECG and an admission of QA and inferior lead. This is the ECG several months before when you did not have chest pain. Uh, you can see the echo right here. Um, severe, you know, the question of inferior wall, hypokinesis, akinesis. And, and this is among the fellows to pay attention because, you know, when you read, read echo and LVAD, okay, the, the sleep, LT valve doesn't open. There's a little bit of, uh, you know, kind of grayish area. Is it, is it real or is this not real? And I think this case is quite interesting because obviously the patient ended up having a clot in the right coronary cusp of the, of the LT root. Uh, as you can see, this is a uh, patient. The, the, the clot exclude, extend inside the proximal RCA. And uh, the decision was, the discussion was, should patient go to the cath lab? And uh, as you can see, there could be even some clot in this cusp as, as well. So this decision was made to use uh, infused thrombolytic in this patient. And patient is symptom improved, but uh, I think, unfortunately, I don't think uh, the club burden has uh, diminished. Uh, patient also is on heparin, but at least he wasn't extending. Uh, so very useful. And this is not being used routinely, obviously, because of uh, this radiation involved in assessing the right ventricle. But if you have a patient with very difficult RV uh, with a window and echo, and you really need to know the RV function. This could be done by CT. We can use both symptom methods, like uh, uh, just like uh, MRI and echo, uh, accurate assessment of RV ejection fraction, or we can do attenuation threshold based, knowing that you could do those modulations, so the radiation those will be more acceptable. Uh, and since we don't really need to look at the coronary, you could use less contrast, like this previous case that I show you, this was used with 40 cc of contrast. Uh, and obviously C, uh, CT is very useful to look at the surgical complication of, uh, uh, such as pericardial tamponade, like in this dramatic case of the patient with a bivad actually. Uh, so, and this is the and last, I want to show you a very interesting case that we just saw uh, last month. The 47 years old gentleman who has, unfortunately has um, a recurrent infection on HARMA3 and uh, with including infection in the eye, multiple surgery, and has come in actually with chest pain after I think a defibrillator changed. So right-sided chest pain, really difficult to control. So you, so a decision was made to do a chest CT. So this is a chest CT done with non-contrast, non-gated, non-contrast CT radiology. And they saw a basic area, which is abnormal, a mass between the outflow cannula and ascending aorta. So first they thought it was a seroma, um, but the patient continue to have chest pain. So we are not doing a contrast study uh, because of the concern that this might not be just a collection that could be a communication like a pseudoaneurysm. As you can see right here, there's contrast, a traversation, there's contrast filling 
in, into the mass. So this is uh, communi in direct communication of the vasculature. So the pseudoaneurysm uh, was suspected and this was confirmed using Gailey CT, as you can see re right here, the contrast translation coming from the anastomosis side, basically filling slowly the cavity. Okay, so this is again, the 3D rendering. And, uh, and because of history of recurring infection, uh, history of recurring infection, this mycotic aneurysm, complication for mycotic aneurysm was suspected. And this is a beautiful study done by Dr. Amala, uh, which we're getting more and more experience. You see the entire LVAD structure has very high SU, S, SUV and with very high uptake in that aneurysm, pseudoaneurysm. Uh, unfortunately, because uh, he's, he also had multiple history of stroke, he wasn't a candidate uh, for explant. Uh, so he's being treated with antibiotic. Um, I just want to mention that uh, uh, my wife mentioned about uh, talk about AOT regurgitation. I mean, she, uh, and because of the difficulty of quantifying AI. Uh, so this CT, if you have good uh, classification, there's a could potentially uh, have a regurgitating orifice area. Um, so that will be one research opportunity to explore uh, uh, the regurgitating orifice area. I mean, I would say lack of cooptation uh, in relationship with the Doppler or uh, hemodynamic finding of ART regurgitation. So how do we scan this patient? Obviously we do ECG gated. We use flash mode uh, if it's a young patient to give, give less radiation. Helical retrospective gating usually reserved for patients who are older uh, and having help and especially for patients who have LVAD as destination therapy, meaning that they are not getting a transplant because we try to minimize the amount of radiation in patients who potentially can go on having a cardiac transplantation. Uh, obviously, uh, we want to see this radiation as possible. Since usually coronary is not a, a concern, um, we don't use as much contrast. Um, so uh, we don't use beta blocker in this patient. And, uh, um, and up to uh, creatine clearance of 45, we usually uh, will perform less than that. And that's a question I need to be answered with CT. We prefer not to do, uh, give contrast in this patient with uh, CKD three or higher. So kind of in, 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 in a, in looking at a uh, patient, you know, presenting with clinical question, what, what would CT fit? Well, when would you use CT? I think CT would be useful when you're looking for clot, obviously. Uh, if you don't have any other options, you want to look at RV function, CT would be a good option. Troubleshooting, I think this is what we use, we use most of the time. Uh, if you have low flow alarm, a suspic suspicion of suction, I think CT is very useful, and I think uh, there's no question the surgical complication or infection, CT and PET are clearly uh, the most adequate test. And that's all I have. And thank you for your attention. We're open for any question. Any question? Oh, I see one question. It says, should progressive AR in an LVAD patient prompt investigation for aortic aneurysm, pseudoaneurysm development? Um, I, I don't think that, um, and Dr. Chang, you can comment on this too, but I, I don't think necessarily aortic regurgitation um, is, an, is uh, related necessarily to formation of aortic aneurysm or pseudo aneurysms. What we're seeing is that progressive aortic regurgitation develops in patients anyways, um, because of the fusion, uh, that is what was seen in some of the pathology studies. 
And as a result of that, you do see progressive aortic regurgitation. Now, there was some study where we looked at like the uh, aorta size and the aorta size in some patients uh, who did develop aortic regurgitation did uh, kind of increase. So uh, one could say that one of the reasons is that, but it's largely because of fusion and the relative change in hemodynamics between the LV and AO. Why it happens is still um, uh, rather unexplained. Uh, but um, we do CT scans as surveillance in all our patients, and what we haven't necessarily seen formation of pseudo aneurysm um, because you know as as a cause for the aortic regurgitation. If you, uh, Dr. Chang, if you agree with that, um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I don't think the pseudo aneurysm is related to the AI uh, personally. Uh, and that those two cases that I show you. Um, I think it's mostly related to infection, the pseudoaneurysm. I'm referring to the pseudoaneurysm uh, between the alpha graft and the ascending aorta. I think that as the most site uh, pseudoaneurysm, that's the only place we've seen that occurs in our, in our experience. And uh, I believe the most related to infection rather than aortic regurgitation. What would be interesting to know is, um, we know the aortic root thrombosis has been attributed to um, lack of opening of the aortic valve. And I, the cases we have, uh, and, and we have kind of random cases. Some of the cases, uh, the aortic valve are open. Some of them are closed. So, but I think aortic regurgitation, is it related to uh, opening of the valve as well, uh, Mawash, do you think? It, um, it, it's, and it's unclear to say, I mean, I don't think that there is a clear correlation and it's hard to do that as well, because as again, sometimes the aortic valve opening or closing is very dynamic. It can be dynamic and the period of time the aortic valve opens again is a product of what your afterload and what your LV pressure is. But um, it, um, you know, I don't think there is a clear correlation, but it is thought that because there's permanent aortic valve closure, um, it can cause um, the uh, atrophy of the valves and fusion. And as a result of that, that's why you see aortic regurgitation. Um, now, Dr. Chang, in our the computational study that uh, we did, we found that, you know, of course, the outflow graph location and how uh, the, the currents recirculate into the ascending aorta might actually be what is causing uh, formation of aortic regurgitation. But uh, that um, is a small cohort and preliminary study but again, these are some things that we are exploring into in our uh, computational lab as well. Yeah, that's an interesting question because oftentimes we see um, patient uh, who has um, stasis in the aortic root, mm -hmm. you know, relatively compared to the alpha channel. Uh, I, I think you know it's not common, uh, but it's an interesting finding, and I think they. That, that there probably lies the clues of how, you know, the stasis in aortic root thrombosis and maybe in some degree aortic valve uh, changes um, uh, leading to the aortic regurgitation. So it's really a lot we, we, we don't know. And really the only way to, to, to find out is to have uh, uh, serial imaging this patient coupled with a more understanding of the uh, clinical courses. And of, obviously, you know, Mawash is doing a lot of work and the idea is to to come out with the a best, uh, hopefully best uh, surgical uh, technique and also how you maintain the pump function to minimize all this potential complication. The other question, Dr. Chang, here is, um, uh, do you uh, monitor LVOT, TVI, and Genla VTI uh, in LVAT patients long-term? Um, uh, I can give a brief answer, and then Dr. Chang, uh, if you want to answer this question. But for me, clinically, um, I don't uh, rely on it necessarily. Uh, we do look at it where patients who have aortic valve opening um, and do see what the LVOT, TVI is or... But in, in clinical, um, and the, the LVAT canal, as I said, you know, can be off axis, and I really don't usually trust uh, the Doppler waveform. So I don't think that it is, we do acquire them. Uh, we, we collect all this data, uh, 
And um, but uh, and I think if the velocity is elevated, it helps. But if it's not elevated, you know, mm -hmm. we have a couple of cases of, you know, the LVAD really malpositioned the cannula tip into the myocardium, and the velocity was unimpressive. So sure. my watch is correct. I mean, the velocity, probably the color Doppler would be more informing than actually the Doppler velocity because you're going to see. If it, a well-positioned inflow cannula, you should see it's almost a laminar flow. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you see a lot of turbulence and a lot of aliasing in your color Doppler, uh, that's highly suggestive of high velocity. So uh, in that case, I, I put you know, more trust in the color Doppler rather than uh, uh, the, the velocity and the spectral Doppler. So on that note, uh, Dr. Chang, the next question, which I think you can answer probably, is what is your Nyquist limit setting for the color doctor in these LVAD patients? Well, I, well, I think for for the new device, uh, my understanding, the, the the maximum velocity is, you know, usually is less than one. Uh, although it's a continuous flow you, and, and it do has some uh, cyclic changes. But a normal, normal study usually I've seen is less than one meter per second. What do you think? I mean, I think over 1.5 should be considered slightly elevated. Yeah, um, I mean, there were some studies which showed that correlation, but to be honest, clinically, I feel like we cannot really translate. I mean, there's a lot of published data on LVAD, um, uh, but I mean, I really don't think that, you know, until I, I think what really needs to happen is uh, you have to correlate what you find on echo and then correlate with CT scan, whether those things are uh, meaningful or not. And as far as the Nyquist limit is concerned for color doctor, we, um, the, the, the paradigm in our lab stays the same. We do acquire like we do acquire for other uh, patients. Whether we should be adjusting the Nyquist limit for this patient is still a question that's unanswered. I don't think anybody's um, answered that question also. I think those were all the questions. Is there anything else that um, uh, anyone wants to comment or talk about? Oh, well, we can probably ask uh, Dr. Amala to have him comment our, uh, our experience. Uh, a pet program because uh, with him here, we started doing more pet and uh, maybe he can comment a little bit about our experience. Sure. Uh, can you hear me all? Yes, yes, we can. Yeah, I think we started to do pet for uh, LVAD infections recently. I think uh, it's a very valuable tool when you are in doubt or are trying to localize infection or assess response to therapies. So I think for many of these patients, uh, it's a very helpful tool because these patients are usually sick and they could get infections elsewhere, but the always, always the concern is whether they had an infection in the LVAD or any of its connections. Um, we have been uh, doing this just recently, and uh, I think we've done nearly 10 cases or a little less than that. And uh, we've had very few negatives, but uh, many positive cases, uh, simply because at this time, the cases that are being referred to us are like more highly suspected and the treating team wanna know if they uh, like the extent of the infection. Uh, yeah, we'd be happy to see more of these cases, especially in the sick population where uh, there is a growing body of evidence now that it is very helpful for the management of these patients and identifying the site of infection and treating them and following them up after with FTG PET. And on the management spectrum, I, I want to add that, you know, do patients do have extensive LVAD infection, which, you know, basically um, the entire LVAD is infected or your PET scan really helps us because there have been patients where if the extent of the infection is very severe, we do consider full exchanges. 
in our institution from one device to another, or like a full exchange, for instance, from HeartMate 3 to HeartMate 3. We've done that, or from an HVAT to HeartMate 3. I mean, that is um, how seriously some of the infections are taken um, because the, the whenever people have infection, particularly with Pseudomonas or Candida, uh, because of these recurrent infections, they're at, at risk of having a catastrophic intracranial bleeds and strokes. Um, so it does change our management uh, for sure, and it's very helpful to have um, to have serial PET scans, which has been a, a new kid on our on our block and has been really helpful in clinical management. Sure. I think that's it, um, uh, Dr. Chang, Dr. Malan. Do you have anything else? Uh, do you want to uh, point at or talk about? No, I think you've covered the topic very well, and we'll discuss a little bit more on the infections and in our upcoming talk on endocarditis later on. Great. Thank you. Thank you.